right, y'all, we've made it to module eight, our last module, yay. This is gonna talk about sport in the 21st century. We will pull from GEMS chapter 11 and Wiggins chapter 18. The premise of this lecture is gonna get us up to speed on sport today. We're gonna look at roughly the last 15-ish years. So we'll look at approximately 2000 to 2015. As we move into the 21st century, sport is no longer just a big business, but it's lucrative business. Throughout the last 15-ish years, franchise values have escalated. The sale of professional franchises are being done with historical amounts. As we've seen over the last actually several weeks, the Houston Rockets just sold to Tillman Fortita for a record amount. We've never seen an NBA franchise or an American franchise sell for the amount it did. In addition to um, this concept of sport as lucrative business, throughout this time teams have threatened to leave cities if they do not provide state-of-the-art facilities. We just saw this in the NFL. The housing bust or the Great Recession did not turn away fans. Pro sport wasn't severely impacted. Even in this post-Michael Jordan era, the NBA has continued to roll with Michael, excuse me, with LeBron James. We've noticed, though, that one of the things that the NBA has done really well, and also Major League Baseball, is this notion of diversifying rosters and playing international games. What does this do? This results in more fans from global or international markets. Lastly, on an interesting note also, Pro sport, specifically Major League Baseball, has turned to analytics. This idea of using numbers to determine talent and find the best deal for that talent. As I mentioned prior, sport is turned into lucrative business. And the NFL may be the greatest example of this. The NFL's latest TV deal has been highly lucrative for them. Furthermore, the Super Bowl has continued to serve as a way to maintain U.S. physical and cultural dominance. Martin and Reeves, though, call this into question in Wiggins chapter 16. He, they discuss how the emphasis of football and mainly of the Super Bowl has led to American preoccupation with this mega event. While this event is incredibly popular and important in mainstream America, it pales in comparison to some of our international mega events. One of the concerns for Martin and Reeves is that we have inflated our notion, one, of the NFL and two, of the Super Bowl in order to, again, pose cultural and national dominance when that really may not be the case. As we have talked about college sport throughout this term, hopefully one of the things we have derived from that is that throughout history, college sport has kept in step with the times. Also, it's important to note, or I want you to make sure you recognize that scandal is not new to college sport. Although we may see it as highly publicized and given a lot of attention today, those scandals regarding even schools that I've mentioned here, such as Miami, UNC, and Penn State, are not necessarily that new to the world of college sport. A couple other things to make mention regarding college sport and how it's keeping in step with the times here in the 21st century. Division I football has gone to a playoff system. Um, in 2014, we went to this. This has increased participation, and coverage. So what does that look like? Even this has trickled down to coverage of high school sport. Also, one of the ways that college sport has kept in step with the times is this conference realignment. Instead of conferences being played because of geographic location, teams are choosing to move to different conferences based upon where they can make the biggest dollar in uh, TV markets. Schools are searching for those spots where they can ultimately land the biggest TV deals and potential payouts.
This, again, we should make mention, while college sport is supposed to surround amateurism, these behaviors ultimately keep in step with the times and or other sporting events of the day. Okay, so let's return to some of our discussion on Title IX and where it is today. Obviously, we talked in the prior lecture that Title IX was instituted in 1972. Some key facts or some things that I think are important. Make note of that top data piece. In 1971, roughly 294,000 girls played high school sport. However, in 2013, that figure has jumped to nearly 3 million. Um, participation across the genders in high school and college is nearly equal. Um, however, we've only seen some small advances in leadership. One of the, you can argue, unintended consequences of Title IX is that in 1972, 90% of coaches of girls' sport were female. Today, or in 2014, that number looks like only 43 0.4% of girls coaches are females. Furthermore, that number is similarly poor in administrative roles, where today roughly only 22.3% of our administrators are female, and in 1972 that was somewhere near 90%. Okay, let's make this distinction of this last point. Under the NCAA, 80% of universities still had not reached gender equity compliance in 2004. What does that mean? Because earlier we talked about this notion of there is some parity in participation. As we've read and talked about Title IX, some of the ways that we have to show compliance is not only in participation opportunities, but also in scholarship dollars, in funds that we put towards facilities, travel, coaches, and the like. All of that to be said, women are experiencing far more opportunities to compete but seeing less opportunities today in the 21st century in administrative and coaching roles. Endorsements for popular modern day athletes are normal and almost expected. But when it comes to female athletes, these endorsements still look a little different. Femininity sells. Um, prior mention, I talked about Anna Kornikova and I also wanna think about maybe even Maria Sharapova. They themselves have had successful endorsements, and for Kornikova specifically, maybe not because of her play, but because of her looks. A bunch of research has continued to show that female athletes continue to be photographed in provocative ways. They are known more for their sex appeal rather than their performance. It's also really interesting to note that beach volleyball is a highly popular sport during Olympics in part because of appearances. At the last Olympics that was hold in Lon held in London, the most expensive ticket to purchase was that of women's beach volleyball. Throughout sport history and American sport history, the Olympics have been key in promoting national dominance. That's no different today and no different in the 21st century. Therefore, bidding for the Olympic Games is an important part of nationalism. Sadly, following the Salt Lake City scandal, the International Olympic Committee created new rules for this bidding process. In doing so, new markets or countries have entered. For example, the last several Olympics have been in China, Russia, and Brazil. Because of overrunning costs and security fears of terrorist attack, some cities have been deterred in recent biddings for the games. We saw this just recently in our own city of Boston. The community of Boston voted against making an Olympic bid, partly because one, the cost and fear of security and or terrorist attacks. Why are the Olympic bids so important? Again, they show a piece of nationalism. And how do they do this? Because they're so widely broadcast. NBC bid $3.5 billion for rights to this in roughly 2002 to 2008. That figure is now up to $4.4 billion for 2014 and 2020. The Olympics are highly commercial, commercialized, highly marketable, and they ultimately 
and give countries or nations the ability to show dominance and power, even today. In the 21st century, we can't talk about sport unless we talk about sport in crisis. The last several years, sport has been marred by several key issues. One, doping. With the Mitchell Report and the Lance Armstrong scandal, sport has been maimed. Also, there has been a number of off-the-field violence. Some of those examples include Michael Vick, Ben Roethlisberger, New Orleans um, Bounty Gate scandal, the Aaron Hernandez murder, Ray Rice beating of his then girlfriend, and ultimately the sexual harassment at Baylor University. The next few slides are going to detail some of these concepts around sport and crisis. It seems in the 21st century that no sport or league has been immune to crisis. Tim Donahue was an NBA official and he was caught and charged with gambling on games. The infamous Jerry Sandusky and even the Canadian youth hockey have resulted in sexual scandals. They've cost, cast doubt on the trust of coaches. We've also seen the sexual promiscuity of a few of our key athletes like Tiger Woods have been highly publicized. Fans In the 21st century, it seems that no sport or organization is immune to crisis or scandal. The NBA saw one of its officials caught when he was gambling on games that he was officiating. Many know the scandal of Penn State and Jerry Sand Sandusky. Few Americans may know, though, there was a somewhat of a similar scandal with the Canadian Youth Hockey League. Because of these sexual scandals, doubt has been cast on the trust of coaches. Some fans have lost hope in their key athletes because of things such as pro sexual promiscuity. In taking question, Tiger Woods. Yet another way we have seen sport in crisis surrounds racism. This issue has been such a concern in the NFL that the Rooney Rule was instituted. This rule requires that every vacant head coaching position must interview a minority candidate. Sadly, even in 2014, only five of the 122 owners of our sports leagues were non-white. Maybe one of the most famous racial issues of the 21st century was Donald Sterling being ousted as the owner of the LA Clippers because of his racist behaviors. The last area we are going to talk about for sport in crisis is concussions. When head injuries, what once was ignored for decades, is now a major public health concern, possibly because of the sheer amount of former athletes that are coming out discussing issues of dementia, depression, and suicide. We've even seen class action lawsuits being brought against the NFL and the NHL. We'll talk a little bit about youth sport in just a second, but there have been large measures and efforts done at lower levels including youth sport, high school sport, to ensure or improve the safety of youth athletes. It's worthy to note that one of the consequences of crisis of sport in the 21st century, I would like to argue, is the rise of popularity of alternative sport. Our X Games began in 1999 and names like Tony Hawk, Jeremy McGrath, and Sean White helped market these sports. Also throughout the 21st century, NASCAR has experienced extensive growth. Sponsorship and technology make this sport highly marketable. Drivers are household names in today's society. And again, this could potentially be because some of the other sports have been tarnished. For sport in the 21st century, we've seen a large emphasis on spectating or watching our major professional leagues. It's also worthy to note that throughout this time, has the running boom has continued. We've seen a rise of the runner. Runners have many options, including things such as marathons, obstacle course runs, charity runs, mud runs. 
marathons both nationally and internationally have led to increases in sport tourism. Recreational running transcends socioeconomic boundaries. That is, the argument is that regardless of what class, socioeconomic class, an individual falls into, most of those individuals have the resources available to be a runner. Sport in the 21st century, as I said earlier, is lucrative business, not only at the professional level, but we're seeing this boom move down to the youth level. There are more sports and more variety for youth, and one of the things that has resulted in this is that there's more adult control and more money-making opportunities. I think one of the key points to point out here is that there's increased media and popularity, and this has resulted in increased exposure for elite athletes. I think it's important to note that as we've in seen increased popularity in our pro sports and our college sports, it has indeed trickled down to our youth sports. Okay, one of the things that we need to note that although sport is a booming business, those elite level youth athletes are partaking or participating in sport at high levels. It's important to know that, that on the other side, the lack of regular physical activity has resulted in a childhood epidemic of obesity and diabetes. It seems that if we, it seems that as if we have these two extremes, these elite level youth athletes that are highly devoted to sport or these individuals at a youth level, particularly children, that are that lack regular physical activity. All right, so here we are at the end of our module eight, and where do we go from here? What's the future of sport? It's worthy to mention, because we didn't talk about it before, we have witnessed a rapid increase in the popularity of MMA and UFC. It will be really interesting to see where that goes forward. Sport has always been, and it's likely still going to be, a point of contention for politics. We've seen the international labor force still at work. Qatar in the World Cup was a political outbreak. And obviously, on native soil, the Boston Marathon bombing. One of the things we should also expect as we go forward, the future of sport is that technology will always continue to increase and alter and shape the way we watch and play. Things such as we've still a rise in fantasy leagues and computer-based games, we're likely to see changes in equipment, which will mean better performances, the way we evaluate players and the way they perform are likely going to change. And finally, how fans connect to athletes and teams will continue to shape and evolve. It will be really interesting to see where we go in the next 15 years. We have reached the end of Module 8. Yay! Here are our questions for thought. Be sure you're fact-checking as well as using these questions to test your application.